Well, good evening again, everybody, and welcome back to the series on the parables that I've been doing. In our last four and of the parables of Jesus, we considered his teaching of a young wealthy ruler of what was necessary for him to do to be a perfect example of a true son of God. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, you sell everything, give to the poor and you follow me. Two things required of him to reach that status. And of course we saw that in Matthew 19.21. And he said, and you do that, you'll have treasure in heaven. He wanted them to throw away his earthly treasure and take hold of heavenly treasure. Unfortunately, his reaction to Jesus' challenge in his life was too much for him, as he had great wealth and possessions, not recognising that what he had now was absolutely nothing. In fact, it was trash to compare with what he would have in the kingdom. And unlike his teacher, was at this point in his life unable to go that far. We noted that so many in this world live very blinkered lives, not being able to see past this present dispensation, unable or unwilling, in many cases, to discern there has to be a maker, a designer, of all that pertains to life on this earth. And that he has a plan for the future of this planet and its people. A plan that was formulated for and through his amazing son. Even the last Adam, as he is called. Ordained to overcome that which the first man was unable to resist. That is, sin in the flesh. Jesus obviously saw something special in this man, and he obviously believed his testimony about keeping the commandments. Because we're told Jesus loved him. He loved him. He loved him. He said, oh, you're, you're, you're pretty good. But, um, but could he be a Job and truly come forth as gold? rather than loving it in this present life for himself. His evident reaction to Jesus' call on his life was too much for him at that time. And we could but hope that he went away and he contemplated what he had rejected. However, we truly don't know the answer to that question. This episode was a great lesson for his disciples when Jesus informed them about the pull of wealth being all but impossible to overcome. As they generally considered the wealthy as those who were blessed of God and obvious contenders for the kingdom. Jesus' parabolic hyperbole that's an over-exaggeration, as we considered, about the camel and the needle certainly shook their understanding. In fact, they were flabbergasted and replied, who then can be saved? Had these men forgotten Jesus' teaching, recorded in Matthew 5? We all know these. They're called the Sermon on the Mount. It's the poor in spirit. <clears throat> It's those that mourn, the meek, those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the, the peacemakers, the persecuted when they're righteous. How many wealthy people would you think would come under those categories that I've just mentioned there from... Matthew 5. Probably extremely few. 
And scripture does mention a few over the millennia, however. Abraham was one. Jacob was another. Joseph, Isaac, Job, David and Solomon certainly were. The important aspect of their lives was that they recognised where their wealth came from. And apart from Solomon, all maintained a strong faith and used their wealth to succour, succour others as well. Not seeking fame or status for themselves. And I'm sure we all recognise just how attaining wealth has such a strong pull on mankind. Thinking that if they become wealthy, all their worries will be over and life will be a breeze. I used to think that once upon a time. Yeah. If I had the right amount of money, I could do this and do that and do other things. Gosh, life will be great. Unfortunately, however, life is not like that. And I presume most of you, being adults here, would recognise that. And it most find that wealth brings a multitude of problems of its own. And you get end up with lots of friends who are only there while the good times, the pleasures and the money lasts. They are more than like lichen and leeches trying to suck you dry and then move on to their next prey. Plenty of them. Scripture certainly has much to say on the subject of wealth and riches. And I want to look at a, a small portion of them tonight because the Bible is really full of it. Have a look here. Psalm 49 verse 6. Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches Truly, no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. So Proverbs 10, 15, A rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. Proverbs 11, 4, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs 19, verse 4, Wealth, as I said before, brings many new friends, but a poor man is deserted by his friend. Also here, we have in 1 Timothy 6, 17-19, it counsels this. They are talking about the rich here that are in the church, and churches do have them. They are to be good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Jeremiah 9.23 Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, nor the mighty man boast in his might, nor the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boasts in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the, world, uh, the Lord. Proverbs 24, 4, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honour and life. Psalm 112 is on its own an amazing psalm related to this situation. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. The off his offspring will be mighty in the land, the generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house. And that doesn't just pertain to what you own and what you have. It pertains to what God gives you as well. And his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious. He's merciful and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously in lens, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. 
he will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His, his heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honour. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. And I love this of what Agar says in, in Psalm 30. And I've always, uh, Proverbs 30, sorry. And I've always sort of taken this for myself. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, Who's the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Jesus went on to declare in Matthew 19, 26, here, and he said, With a man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. That was in relation to his um, little par um, little parable, hyperbole parable there. And um, also, as the angel Gabriel declared in Luke 1, 30, for nothing will be impossible with God. Genesis 18, 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. He's talking to Abraham. And um, that there is a preponderance of those who reject any god in this age and I'm sure we recognise that the theory of evolution plays an awful large part in that, is plainly seen in our lives and in our education system these days. That this God of the Bible is able to do so much more than we can ask or think and has full control over all the elements of this world uh, is, is no longer recognised or believed by the majority. And how sad is that? In fact, how pathetic is that? As he left on record all that he has done, all that he's doing right now, and all he's going to do in the future. Who else has ever done that? As they call, them, they call a God. No one. Yet notwithstanding, his word is the world's largest selling book still. So many are ignorant of just how amazing this book and its insights into the human psyche um, and the methodology and purpose of all God's works that are aimed at producing the greatest benefits for mankind now and most especially in the future. Man loves the pleasures of this world even when they have obvious terrible results. And a, the drug scene is probably the greatest example of that, as is the overindulgence in alcohol, which itself leads to many other problems, as we well know, due to its ability to drastically lower our inhibitions. The no-nos we would or might normally not adhere to. Proverbs 23 is quite interesting in this one. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine. Those who go by the dry uh, to try mixed wine. Do you not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly? In the end, it bites like a serpent and it stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. I can personally verify a lot of that, unfortunately, in my younger days. Man is struggling to cope with all the problems 
that are manifest in this free and easy modern world. With suicide and depression being like a cancer in most countries these days, there seems to be no country that doesn't have these problems, as is divorce and many other relationship problems. The inequality of wealth distribution. The differing, clique, different, differing cliques or groups within countries, all wanting power, are also wreaking havoc. And we're seeing that more and more all the time. Kingdom against kingdom inside nations. Driven by the modern global media entities that all suggest that they have the truth and everything else is fake when it's all fake. The facts, the wherewithal to govern for the best of all. Who to believe? Who to follow? Who really cares about you and me? Who will give me peace of mind? Who will provide what I need to survive? Praise God. He has caused us and many others to see and understand and through his Son and his Spirit to recognise what is right and true and who indeed dispenses truth for all who are honest enough to dig into, to seek whether he really has the knowledge and the power, of course, the understanding, the wisdom, the mercy and compassion, the means, the power to do as he states. So therefore, we know who that is, and we can cry out a loud yes, amen, can't we? Peter, upon hearing Jesus reply to the young ruler to sell up and distribute his wealth and possessions to the poor and follow him, in Matthew 27, he asked Jesus, he says, Lo, truly I say to you in the new... Oh, sorry, I've got the wrong one there. Um, Lo, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Basically, he was saying, what's in it for us? Anything wrong with that? Definitely not. But, and uh, Jesus then outlines the glorious future set out for these disciples and especially for the twelve, that is minus Judas, but adding Matthias. Matthew 19, 28 declares, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Wow! Who? Oh. Got something out of this? This is worth it. How does this great reward impact on our own situations? Being disciples of Christ, while we have not yet had to leave family and homes to follow him, we know that things will not always be as rosy as they are now. And we discussed this aspect on Wednesday evening in our Hebrew study in Hebrews 10, 32 to 36 just quickly go through that again recall the former days after you were enlightened you endured a hard struggle with sufferings sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners for those who were so treated for you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you know that you yourselves have a better position and an abiding one Amen Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what has been promised. The point is, all of God's people are going to face tribulation and persecution to test their faith, their trust in our Lord and our God, <clears throat> to do as he has promised to all who are his, in every generation. Like Peter and the other disciples, we need a hope. We need a vision, a reason to maintain that faith. And were it not for that, none of us would be here. Or if we were, you'd be a bit kinky, stupid. 
Hopefully, we are all good ground, ground that receives the seed of the word with joy and gladness and gladly hang in there when the times get tough. Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, 12 and 13 says this, And we labour, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 16, I urge you then, be imitators of me. So we've got to imitate him in putting up with all these things, he's saying. Um, he's also talking about his uh, spiritual uh, level. Matthew 5.10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' name, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5.44, And I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I have to say, that would be the hardest one that I would have to cope with in life being able to do that, to bless those who give me a really hard time. It certainly doesn't come naturally. Jesus' letter to the churches in Smyrna in Revelation 2 lays it on the line, as it were, when he informs them to not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful even unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Oh, that's a good affirmation there for them because of what they went through. Second Timothy 2.12 tells us, If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Peter, 1 Peter 2.20 for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, uh, you endure. This is gracious, is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And I'm sure we all remember that well-known quote from Hebrews 11.6, that without faith it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Matthew 19, 29 goes on to say this, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. And as in many other instances, it's actually a pity that there is a chapter division in our modern Bibles as what Jesus uh, is declaring in Matthew 9.30, oh, sorry, back to that 19.30, but many who are first will be last and the last first, which was the title of my talk tonight. It's a precursor to what follows in Matthew 21-16, to when he states the same again, but reverses it. Consequently, it becomes obvious that these two chapters are very complementary and aimed at the same outcome. So let's take a look at 20. I won't go through the whole thing because Johnny read it for us tonight. But it's talking about heaven being like a master of a house. Sorry, the kingdom of heaven. Being like a master of a house, he went out early in the morning for laborers in his vineyard. And we know that initially he took on some laborers. He offered them a denarius or a penny, as some say. Then he took on others again at lunchtime, some mid-afternoon, some late in the afternoon. And then he called the, the last first and paid them the same as what he paid the ones that had been there all day. And the opening... Oh, i better go on to the next verse. Uh, yeah, Matthew 20, 13. Yep. I choose to give to this last work as I give you and I'm not allowed to do what he, I choose with what belongs to me or do you begrudge me my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. The opening verses should cause us to reflect on just who this householder 
may represent, because this is talking about the kingdom of heaven, as we noted. Consider Isaiah 5 verse 1 through to 4 and verse 7. Let me sing for my beloved my song concerning his vineyard. My beloved has a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it, cleared it of stones, planted it of choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done? For the vineyard of the Lord, uh, of, the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are its pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. As Jesus is rightly heir of all things, and especially this earth, uh, we can probably envisage him as the householder. As he was the prophet like after Moses that called men unto God's service, even servants to labour at God's business, even his vineyard. While men are up and about, God is always calling them into his service, no matter the time of day. That God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him and working for him is well known. And we know and understand as well that Jesus will return to this earth and set up the kingdom of God and bring his reward with him. Isaiah 40, verse 10, Behold, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And again in Isaiah 62, Behold, the Lord has proclaimed the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Revelation 22. Behold, I am coming soon bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. What does the peri, uh, penny or the denarius represent here in Matthew 20? As the amount paid to each worker was the same no matter how long they told it the task. There's a little bit of controversy over this amongst the commentators. Personally, I believe it has to represent eternal life. Knowing that, again, Jesus is speaking um, concerning the kingdom, as we notice in verse 1. And the outcome for all who are in him as labouring servants. That Jesus has no problems with those that come to him late in the peace, as it were, is of no consequence. As the episode of the thief on the cross demonstrates when Jesus accepts his repentance and plea and states, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. All this demonstrates the depth of the mercy and grace of our God and his Lord, as well as their long suffering towards those who eventually come to terms with the flesh, with self and allow the Spirit of Christ to imbibe and to cleanse us from all filthiness, all iniquity. As Romans 8, um, verses 1 and 2 mentions, there is therefore now, we sung it, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus, of life in Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law of sin and death. I beseech you therefore, brethren, in, in Romans 12, 1, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and, uh, and perfect will of God. 
Some commentators suggest the wage cannot represent eternal life because it can't be earned. However, there is an aspect of work required by believers and followers that is based on faith and love and not the works of the law, as Paul expounds in Galatians 2. And as James declares in James 2, 17 and 18, even so, faith, if it has not works, it's dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I will show you my faith by my works. And in verse 26, whereas the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Knowing as well as Paul in Romans 6.23 states, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's interesting, the word gift here is the Greek charisma. We use that in another sense today, but it actually um, <clears throat> it means uh, a gratuity, an endowment, which means money given for services rendered. And uh, and, and, uh, and it, an endowment, of course, means a donation, a gift, a grant, a legacy. We recognise, of course, that there is nothing that we can do to earn salvation. That is a free gift of grace, through faith. But as most of us know and understand, there is a walk to walk and there is work to be done through the talents that our God has endowed each member of Christ's body with. The different abilities, knowing that all are necessary for the effect of working of the body, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 12. We won't go into that tonight. What I find most encouraging in our small, compact fellowship is that we can truly recognise those talents that have been gifted amongst us. Talents that demonstrates the Spirit working effectively as members of the body of Christ. We may not be perfect, some of us may be, but, you know. but praise God, we're well on the way and may we always be climbing higher in our walk before him. We note in this parable in Matthew 20, how those that were long at the task complained that the householder paid them as much as those who were towards the shortest. Some had probably only worked for maybe an hour, two hours at the most. What they failed to recognise, as was pointed out to them, was the goodness of the master who chose to endow the latecomers with the same amount that they had agreed to and who alone is good. We know who that is, none but God, as Jesus noted in Mark 10, 18. Our God knows all hearts, as Jeremiah 17, 10 tells us. The Lord searches the hearts. He says, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So therefore we know that he rewards accordingly. What we need to understand is that, is that in the godly realms there are obvious levels of status. And while we become equal to the angels in the resurrection, our equality is limited to eternal life itself. James and John wanted to be able to sit with Jesus on either side of his throne. But as Jesus pointed out to them, it, it's, it's not mine to offer these positions in the kingdom. It was the Father. That men like Abraham, Moses, Job, Elijah, and so many others will be granted great status. As noted when Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, um, when he was speaking to Moses and Elijah, recorded in Matthew 17. And also in Ezekiel 14, 14, um, 
<clears throat> where Noah, Daniel and Job are noted for their righteousness. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. And uh, in Hebrews 11.35, um, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, but they might obtain a better resurrection. What can this better resurrection represent? It means, better, better here, it means nobler and a higher status. Jesus' declaration in Matthew 16, um, 2016, I suspect can have two meanings. And we'll have a look at that. So the last shall be first and the first last. For many shall be called, but few chosen. And in uh, Romans 1, 16, whose writings uh, we see here that, uh, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Hebrews 9, 15, for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9.18 Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. And there is little doubt that those whom we considered earlier, Abraham, Moses, etc., will undoubtedly be among those considered first in the kingdom. However, as we well know, there will be many who held high positions who have considered right to enter that narrow gate who will find themselves as secondary or even last in the kingdom. That there will be those of the Gentiles who will also be given exalted positions is truly manifest as Paul witnessed to the fact that he would turn to the Gentiles and that they would listen to him. Yeah, Romans 15, 12, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and in him shall the Gentiles trust. And in Acts 28, 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Many believe Luke was a Gentile physician, and he would surely be among them. We know that there were many martyrs among the early Christian communities whose names are not known. But we know that the Lord knows them and he will reward them accordingly and also those who go through the future tribulation and maintain their faith enduring unto the end. Undoubtedly, many of these will be in the Hall of Fame, as it were on that day and receive what one might call a better resurrection. We have some examples of the last being first in the Old Testament scripture. Especially we look in the life of Joseph, who was the youngest, the last, of, of 11 brothers and when sold as a slave. And then David, who was the youngest of all his siblings who... Um, and each was last in rank and status, yet went to being first through their faith in the living God, as even Jacob bowed before his son. Do we perceive in this parable that those who started later in this present, uh, in this day, in the day, represent those who by faith accepted what the Master said? when he stated, whatever is right, I will pay you. In Matthew 24 and 7, he said, I will give you also unto the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Because, and they said unto him, because no man has hired us, he said unto them, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatever is right, that you shall receive. That we are entering into God's vineyard, 
is spelt up by Paul in Romans 11, 16 to 18. For the first first fruits are holy, the lump is also holy, and the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakes of root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if you boast, you bearest not the root, but the root thee. And then Romans 4.13, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise that might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, Jew and Gentile. Can we envisage that those that complained that latecomers were given the same reward as the original workers, being the Jews' response to the kingdom message, which others accepted, and their response to the Gentile calling, which is recorded, of course, in Acts. It would seem relevant that these men were paid and then dismissed with a curt, go your way, to complain us, which may be a hint towards what eventuated in AD 70 and has lasted nearly 2,000 years since. So in summary, who were the first and who were the last? If we consider in context of what Jesus has declared previous to this parable, there is little doubt that he is referring to those who were rich, the privileged, the legally minded men who were content with the here and now and the status quo. These are those with a sense of self-worth, proud of their own achievements and life under the law. The last first are those who recognise that they are destitute, they're poor in spirit, they're humble, who recognise the Christ as Messiah and Saviour, even the Son of the living God and who by faith accept the grace offered them through his sacrificial death on the cross. As we noted, this has all to do with the kingdom and that dispensation. And it is relevant that Jesus states in Matthew 20, 16, the last shall be first, shall, speaking of a future state, one that all faithful men and women await with patience, with endurance, with tenacity. I love that word tenacity in relation to this. You really hang in there strongly. This portion of scripture finishes with an ominous warning to all who hear the call. Many are called, but few are chosen. Reminding us that the narrow is the gate and constructed is the way which leads to life. And there are few that find it. And again in Luke 13, 24, Strive to enter in at the narrow gate, for I say to you, many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Challenging, isn't it? But praise God that through Jesus and his spirit, we can do all things. He is totally willing to help to strengthen us in times of weakness, in times of need. We just need to remember to humbly ask, to beseech, to implore him for grace and mercy, knowing that he is a faithful high priest. And I'd like to finish tonight's talk reading uh, Paul's exhortation that we find in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet 
without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Amen.